All right. Greetings, everyone, and welcome to episode zero of the Best Available web series. In this series, together, we are going to be following the adventures of the group known as the Best Available as they rise to prominence and begin exploring the deadly dungeon known as Undermountain in the hopes of preventing the monsters of the deaths from spilling over into the streets of Waterdeep. As everyone has varying levels of knowledge, I'm going to try my best to explain terms, rules, and to a lesser extent, memes. So if you already understand, I apologize. Just know that for someone who isn't already in the know, it helps a lot. Better a cutter than a burk, right? And that right there is Sigilcant from Planescape. Feel free to look that up. It's pretty awesome. I try to spread it wherever I can. So, a session zero is something that a lot of dungeon masters, DMs for short, use in order to set the groundwork for their campaign. It lets people know what to expect out of the game and often ranges from addressing the expected tone, whether wacky hilarious adventures, dark and serious toned crawls, or even spooky horror games, to ensuring that everyone knows the details of the world they need to be aware of, like race or class restrictions, availability of magic items, and so on. We are going to be doing a little bit of the same thing here, except that you're going to hear a lot more about what kind of adventure you'll be watching instead, but I'll promise to be a little less verbose so as to not run you over with a bunch of lore and information. I want you entertained, not dazed and confused wondering why you're listening to this guy with a voice that was made for silent television. I'm no pro status YouTuber, but I'll try and at least be capable of putting some timestamps in here to make sure you can hop between different parts of our session. First off, let's introduce the world. Note, this contains light spoilers for Storm King's Thunder, Princess of the Apocalypse, and Dungeon of the Mad Mage Adventures. Heavier spoilers for Dungeon of the Mad Mage will come along when we get to the Dungeon of the Mad Mage. That should probably go without saying, but I mean, hey, you never know. Those of you who know the names Undermountain and Waterdeep will likely already understand, but our campaign setting is the Forgotten Realms. And before I get more specific, I have to give you one caveat. Almost every Dungeon Master has their own headcanon for their world, so probably don't expect everything I say in my games to perfectly link up with Forgotten Realms lore. I try to hit the high points, but ask three different DMs whether the family line of Alagondar ended, or how to pronounce Klaugiliamatar, and you'll probably get three different answers. And yes, I totally pronounced it right. Probably. I think. Anyway. For those of you FR history buffs, the events in this campaign take place in the year 1492 DR. Recent happenings of import include the completion of the Storm King's Thunder campaign by an adventuring group during the previous year. At the end of their successful adventure, they established a town on the long road between Mirabar and Longsaddle, known as Forge Home. This didn't sit very well with the people of Mirabar, but the hero's destruction of a certain adamantium construct that some fire giants were able to rebuild simmered them down just enough. At least for now. That is a story for another time, though. Instead, in this game, we focus on the plight and one of the stranger celebrations of Waterdeep itself. You see, in my world, the Lords of Waterdeep regularly receive a strange message along with three chests delivered to them magically. One made of copper, one of silver, and one of gold. The contents of these messages are not known except to the Lords themselves, and they are not talking, of course but the receipt of these chests always heralds a particular festival. After the first few disasters, the Lords of Waterdeep were able to suss out the intention of this message and its accompanying chests. Their arrival heralded a large increase in the population of monsters that dwell in the dungeon beneath Waterdeep, known as Undermountain. This vast labyrinthine complex is home to many a kind of monster. Some are powerful brutes, some contain a devilish intelligence, and all are dangerous to your common Waterdavian citizen. Though it is largely unknown who sends these items, what is known is ignoring the dangers they warn of has cost the lives of many citizens, and when monsters burrow up from beneath your streets and estates, they don't often care whether you are rich or poor, just the sounds you make when you scream. To combat this oncoming tide, at first guards and military squads, and then eventually adventurers, were gathered and sent into the complex. Oftentimes, these groups would not return at all, but occasionally some did, and even fewer brought with them a mystic key. These keys, made of the same three metals as the chests, are quite an easy connection to make, but once this connection was discovered and the immense treasure within revealed, the one thing that was not so simple was making sure groups didn't kill each other off in search of vast wealth and limitless power. 
After the first time that a military operation inside of the dungeon failed because infighting broke out over one of the keys, the lords of the city devised a plan to serve the public interest as well as their own, and it has worked out almost flawlessly ever since. Now, when the chests appear, instead of hushed voices, there are shouts! And where once the people of Waterdeep girded themselves and dreaded the coming, now they take to the streets in celebration, as this is a sign that many in Waterdeep are about to get a new lease on life. Instead of a dreaded occurrence, the Lords of Waterdeep have created a great festival that calls to adventurers of great reputation from across the realm to come and try their hand at clearing out Undermountain. The streets are stuffed with wagons, the rooftops rife with streamers, and in noble manses and shadowy inn-rooms, noble and commoner alike plot and plan on how best to strike it rich when Waterdeep's gold rush comes into town in the pouches and pockets of every contestant. Each group that enters must have at least some reputation, be decently seasoned, yum, and have a patron that supports them. Only 20 parties will adventure down from the yawning portal to do battle with the denizens of those ancient halls, and a certain someone is seeking a way to hedge his bets. Zacharias Rowe, an enigmatic wizard and one of the Council of Adventurers that presides over the people of Forgeholme, has a use for a group of adventurers delving into the dark halls that Halaster built, so he devised a spell to bring him to the perfect group, and that is where we meet our group of fledgling adventurers for the first time. Before we get to that, though, though some of the members of our group may change over time, as with any campaign, shift happens, knowing a little bit about each of the initial members will cause things to make a bit more sense. Every player has their own story, and they are the center of it. It's my job as the Dungeon Master to make sure their journey is equal parts fraught with peril and filled with reward, so understanding them is crucial. Anyway, without further ado, Here's a short intro for each of our starters. Angela Hawthorne. If you're wondering who the ponytailed crusader is that seems so often to be right up in the thick of things, then this first intro won't leave you wanting. Born as the middle child of a Waterdavian guard captain and an inventive, caring mother, Angela Hawthorne was destined for a life of adventure, as the girl would never have guessed that her father was actually an illegitimate child of a Neverwintian knight. Unfortunately, in her adolescence, her father was arrested by a mysterious group of soldiers for unknown crimes, and just a short while after she lost her mother and uncle when a mysterious cleric of Shar attacked her in the streets of Waterdeep. After a stint infiltrating a pirate crew while trying to find the cleric, who had fled to the trackless sea, she returned with only a dead end, so as her elder sibling took over the family home, she set out to make a name for herself, discover her father's whereabouts, and be the paragon of justice she had always hoped to be. After a few years of taking minor mercenary gigs to clear basements of rats or chase off livestock thieves, she is sitting at the yawning portal with one of her father's colleagues and two other aspiring adventurers ready to make a difference. Bethaniel Silver Ray There is a saying that every party needs a cleric. And while that's not always true, there are many times this band of adventurers would have been lost without its worshipper of Sehanin Moonbow. Raised solely by his mother, Bethaniel spent most of his youth with his twin sister, watching his mother's scholarly pursuits as she climbed the social ladder in Waterdeep, their free time spent studying the arcane or participating in sibling rivalry. You know, like you do. Though his sister left early, his mother's climb finally paid off, and Bethaniel was brought into some upper circles due to their station and the promise he had shown with arcane knowledge. Sadly, the young elf's mother fell prey to a scam by another noble, and Bethaniel himself was forced to take the fall for a terrible crime he had not committed as payment for them being bailed out. During his torture, the elf resisted demands for his co-conspirators, and though the torture left him scarred, he never broke. Discovering his faith and emerging as a quiet soul, the young man faced his sentence. To serve in the military. He did so with distinction, even rising to supplant his commander upon the man's dire injury in the field. Having survived this injustice and earning a pardon for the crime he never committed, he keeps a promise to an old friend he met on the battlefield, ever ready to guide Angela's course, though even she herself does not know his true purpose in her life. Nick. 
Natalia Volkov. Not every adventurer's history is one of a decided rise to prominence or done to the beating of a guardian angel's wings. Sometimes all one has is their own moral fabric, a line they will not cross, and a desire to atone for those they crossed before. Natalia was born into a stark poverty. Her mother a strumpet in the slums of Baldur's Gate, and her father unknown, the girl's upbringing was filled with petty theft and organized crime, and she was only able to shed that brutal existence by embracing an even darker one. A girl of strong will and stronger arm found that the pay of an enforcer put food in her belly, and that of an assassin even more. By the time she reached her teens, she was a seasoned thug who had crushed any qualms she had about taking a life, and it was this life of sin that brought her into contact with the Chapel of Scorn. The cultists were the one thing those crime bosses and gang leaders weren't. They were kind. Their sickly sweet words were like a balm to the girl, and they fed and clothed her, claimed she was special, and began to instruct her not only in scholarly things like reading and writing, but also in their tenets. Fighting and killing wasn't survival anymore. It was a prayer. As the years rolled on, though, she felt more and more off inside. And when the day came that her mother was the one upon the altar, Natalia cried out and sighed for help. But there was no answer. Some prayers do not break out from the dark places of the world. She had no more questions after the ritual. All that she had to ask had been answered, and she fled. She shed the cult's trappings and now seeks atonement, forever fleeing the past she knows is pursuing her. Ara Sergal. If one cleric is good, then surely two is even better, and this kind beauty has healing hands to spare for those who continue the fight against the darkness, her magics fueled by the hope that she will be able to finally find a way to be truly free. Born to a wealthy merchant family, Ara was raised primarily by her father, who saw her as more of an asset to his lineage than a daughter. She quickly became obedient and dutiful, unwilling to risk the man's wrath, and finding solace in his satisfaction with her presenting the image of the perfect daughter. When the overbearing man began to seek a suitable partner for her to marry, though, the girl balked at it, and when she realized she was at a crossroads, she made her decision. She fled her family home and left behind the forced life she'd had to endure. Being relatively pampered through her upbringing, though, she had few life skills to call on. Her longing and need to choose her own path struck a chord with the divine, and that night she received a vision. A woman clad in a blue and white dress offered her the strength to continue her journey in return for representing her in the realms. Between the other roads she could choose, Ara knew that this was the best path. She took the cold-skinned woman's hand and awoke with Hecate's holy symbol in her palm and the goddess's mark upon her heart. Free to walk where she wills for the first time, she seeks the adventure of a life she'd never been able to know before. Now to get into something a little more granular. Almost every role-playing game is going to have house rules or optional rules included in it, even if it doesn't seem like it. Different people like different things, so it is inevitable that you are going to discover some customizations that individuals or groups like. Nothing wrong with that as long as everyone is in agreement and those ground rules are worked out ahead of time. First, let's go over the optional rules. Feats. Like many dungeon masters, I like to use feats because they give players much more customization when it comes to their characters. Some are more powerful than others, but none of them really seem bad. Every 5th edition D&D game I've seen allows feats, but this is an optional rule, so it's worth mentioning, if only to remind someone out there that doesn't like feats that they don't have to allow them. The Unearthed Arcana Ranger I'm sorry, I'm going to say it. A ranger is oof levels of awful, so if you're going to play Era in my game, you're going to have to use the UA Ranger rework. Trust me, you'll be happier, I'll be a bit sadder that you dumpster things so fast, but that's my problem. Don't worry, I'm THE Forever DM. I can take it. There are some other smaller things that get even more detailed, like for instance how I handle the fact that Warcaster doesn't say anything about allowing you to utilize material components while armed, just somatic ones. 
And if you really want me to go into that, let me know in the comments below or on my Buy Me A Coffee page and I'll go over it. For now though, I'll spare you the intimate details. There are plenty of other great videos to help you sleep out there, after all, and that's really not my intent here. Now on to the house rules. These are the potentially ugly ones. Sometimes you just gotta house rule something. Maybe it's bad and should be better. Maybe it's too good for its level. Not everybody's gonna agree with the ruling, but if you're making it for the good of the game and so the whole group can have fun, then a house rule is the way to go. By the way, that includes you, DM. You need to have fun too. Stop being ashamed of that. Like before, let people know as soon as possible when something is changing, and as always, try your best to be fair. It's an impossible task to complete, but just like acting morally, it's one of the things that is always the right path to travel. Maximum hit points. I like combat. Not like, a little, a lot. I spent a lot of my nerdy youth doing sword fighting all over my home state and having fun in tournaments. I love the epic battle scenes in movies like <laughs> and <laughs> Hmm, maybe I'll tell you later. Anyway, that means that I really want to have those knockdown drag out fights. However, comma, I also like my players to feel like big damn heroes, so I don't want them pushing up daisies every time they plow face first into a line of enemies, so every hit die you gain in my game is going to be maximized. Flex on, Barbarians. Flex on. Consumables as a bonus action. Kind of going hand in hand with my desire for epic battles, having to use your whole combat round just to swag a potion that's going to heal you for 2d4 plus 2? Sag. Just sucks. I'm not saying you need to be able to eat 37 lobsters in a magical fire ring because you hit the pause button on your turn. Todd Howard, green-hatted elf, looking at you. But surely a skilled adventurer can do better than that. In most of my games, I allow players to use consumable items with their bonus action. Mostly this applies to potions, allowing them to stay in the fight longer, but also the occasional enchanted giant toenail or animal heart. Man, those Uthgar barbarians sure know how to party. Summon OPOP Spirit This one doesn't come into play for a while, but it's a worthwhile mention. A series of Summon X Spirit spells came out, Woodland, Aberration, Undead, I don't know, I don't remember them all. What matters is that this is the most overpowered option for any class that can cast that spell. Seriously, somebody was either asleep at the wheel, or they got one of them old Ronin guys from 3.5 to come make a splat book. The damage this thing puts out is obscene for simply needing to concentrate and leaving you totally open to do whatever you want with your action. It was a simple enough change to make it so that you can only use your summon's multi-attack if you use your character's action to direct them. Much better balance. Trust me. Shield spell damage resistance. Being a bounded accuracy system has really meant a lot for ease of DMing, and allows for a lot of on-the-fly math that only those with quantum entanglement theories of their own were really able to make use of before. There are a few things that slipped through the cracks in places though, and SHIELD became one of these in several of my games. Armor class shenanigans, don't pistol whip me captain, can get pretty insane when it comes to multiclassing, and there are lots of builds I've seen that use shield to effectively immunize characters against attack rolls. Now, I could go and do workarounds with saving throw effects and such, but that also reduces the defenses of people who aren't trying to abuse corner cases to gain a faux invincibility. Instead, just a quick snip here and there, and shield is still a great spell, it just lacks the save or suck like aspects. So, in my games, instead of a plus 5 to armor class, casting shield grants immunity to magic missiles as normal, and resistance to slashing, bludgeoning, piercing, sonic, and force damage until the start of their next turn. This actually seems to make it more useful for normal spellcasters in high level play, because getting a plus 5 to AC doesn't help when the monster hit AC 27, but taking half damage when something snatches your little squishy up feels great, and looks cool cinematically. At least I think so. Precognition Nerf This isn't something that most parties ever deal with, and that we won't see for a very long time. Precognition is, frankly, even a little overpowered for a 9th level spell, so I made some changes to it. That way it doesn't feel as bad when you run into an enemy using it, and players see it balanced against other spells of its level. 
I change the description of the spell to this. You touch a willing creature and bestow a limited ability to see into the immediate future. For the duration, choose one of the following. The target can't be surprised and has advantage on ability checks. The target has advantage on attack rules. The target has advantage on saving throws. Other creatures have disadvantage on attack rolls against the target. And of course, this spell immediately ends if you cast it again before the duration ends. I find that to be a little more balanced, both for enemies and players. Plus, let's just be honest, it's fun to talk about 9th level spells. Player Consent you're not going to hear it, but because I record my sessions with the intent to publish them, I make sure that everybody who sits down at my virtual tabletop knows they are being recorded. For some, it takes a lot of courage just to sit at a table with a bunch of people, and being recorded can only add to that anxiety. Anxiety does not a happy player make, and I want my players happy and having fun while knowing that their epic exploits are going to be shared with so many others. You'll laugh. You'll cry, you'll kiss 10 bucks goodbye as you subscribe to my Buy Me A Coffee page. Seriously, you can and totally should. This is my one plug, and I'm doing this in one take, so that was really hard. I'd appreciate it. Anyway, all of my players have agreed beforehand to be recorded and have those recordings used, so please, if you want to publish anything, just make sure you respect the privacy and care for those who are in your games. After all, if we adventurers don't stand together out of character, then how can we ever hope to succeed in character? This is the end here, and in closing, I just wanted to say thank you for listening. I really hope that this gave you some cool insights, some ideas for your own games or characters, and especially made you hungry to watch more of my content. I'm really having a lot of fun making this for you, so drop me a like if you liked it at all, or just want to make me smile. Subscribe if you haven't already so that you'll see when our next video goes live, and if you'd like to support me, you can pop over to the Buy Me A Coffee page I've linked in the description. You can get unique rewards there, like previews of what's up and coming, fan artwork that gets made gets uploaded there, and if you support at a higher level, you can even get character sheets for my games. While I was recording this, we even shot past our first goal, and together with my artists, I've started posting my own custom content on my page, as well as in some other places, so you can take some of the Forever DMs, items, spells, races, and other creations and work them into your own games. This is free for everyone to enjoy, because at the end of the day, this isn't about making money. It is about making a happier and healthier gaming experience for everyone. We all live together. And with some dedication, we can make things happen that will inspire people for generations to come. Gary Gygax and all his friends did it when they opened this door for us, and if we can do the same for just one person, then that is a life well lived. You can follow me on Twitter for updates as well. I'm not anywhere else yet, but hey, we'll get there. For now, thank you for the view, and keep up the adventuring. There's gold pieces out there just laying on the floor somewhere. I'm sure your pouch can keep them nice and warm. And here is a thank you to my current subscribers, and everyone I can remember who helped make this project a reality. I can't express how thankful I am for each and every one of you helping me to live my dream and bring these beautiful adventures to you, so if I forgot something or something slipped my mind, no DM is perfect, we just try, shoot me a message and I will rectify that ASAP. And with that, this episode comes to a close. I'll see you in the next one. Forever DM, 